The original Land Cruiser 70 series was sold from 1984 to 2004, with an old school design and focus on simplicity, durability, and off-road capabilities, they remain popular even today. In Japan, the Prado officially launched in 1990. The Prados from this era are basically lighter duty Land Cruisers. There are three major differences between these and the normal Land Cruisers. The Prados came with more seats and were geared towards carrying more passengers rather than more luggage. These had softer suspensions for a more comfortable everyday driving experience. In Japan, the Prados came only with diesel engines and they had lower displacements than their Land Cruiser counterparts. Speaking of the engines, the earlier models came with the 2LTE while the latter models like this one had the 1KZTE. Both are straightforward turbo diesels, but these have a lot more power. This 3-liter engine puts out 130 horsepower and 290 Nm meters of torque and can be found in the Hilux and the Hiaces. Before moving on, I want to give a special thanks to K's Factory for letting me borrow their Prado for the day. Come check out their awesome inventory. Starting with the front, what I really like about this design is that it's mostly rectangular, but you have these soft round edges which really balance it out. For the most part, it's very simple and functional. What stands out the most is probably this aluminum trim which you have throughout the vehicle, on the sides and in the rear bumper as well. One thing that's interesting is this tiny mirror. I mean, look at it, it's so tiny. Behind the bumper, you have a couple tow rings which can be useful when you're off-roading. Some Prados have fenders that flare out more than this. I prefer this cleaner look, but it also means that you can't get fatter tires because your tires can't protrude past the width of the vehicle. Here are the dimensions for this Prado. The hood looks small relative to the rest of the vehicle, but it is taller than most SUVs on the road today. Many 70 series are lifted up and kitted with tons of accessories, whereas this one is pretty much how it came straight out of the factory. The only significant change they made on the exterior is adding manual locking hubs. In order to engage four-wheel drive, you turn this from free to lock and press a button on the dash. This hub lock button has been disabled, so once you rotate the diff locks, you need only press the H4 button. Manual lockers tend to be more dependable, but it could just be that the originals weren't properly maintained. The only thing that really curves a lot are these wheel arches, but even these are pretty straight. I think this Land Cruiser font is pretty cool as well. Reminds me of the Transformers. You can also find it on the mud flaps. The fuel cap cover can be opened with a lever underneath the steering wheel or directly with the car key. There are ducts on both sides that release air when the doors are closed. Moving to the rear, you have a continuation of that simple functional design with the rectangular shapes and the soft round edges. The brake lights make the rear the most colorful part of this vehicle. The high mount stop lamp will not be required in Japan for another decade and was intended for satisfying overseas requirements. One thing that is a little disappointing is this dinky little muffler. It doesn't seem to really fit with the rest of the vehicle. Having the spare tire is obviously useful in various situations, but a lot of people take it off because they prefer the cleaner look. Another reason why people take off the spare tire is because these hinges are prone to rust. There are horror stories where the rust corrodes so poorly that the whole door just falls off, and it's the added weight of the tire that's the culprit. Of course, all this can be avoided if you just replace your darn hinges. To access the trunk, you must first open the left rear door. You can fold up the third row to the sides and also the second row forward for additional luggage space. Jumping inside, the first thing you notice is this rad 90s interior. Thankfully, it's not too colorful and blends in well with these dull gray pieces. Similar to the exterior, there's strong focus on the functionality and durability of all these pieces. You could tell that everything is very well built and meant to last. I would prefer a bit more color, but everything is neatly laid out for ease of use. This one has a CD player, cup holder, and tray in place of where you could put a navigation. This button is to increase your engine rotation when the car is in idle. Basically, it helps warm up the engine, which can be helpful when you're trying to generate external power. Next to the gear shift, you have the lever to engage low range for extreme terrains. This ECT button stands for Electronically Controlled Transmission and basically helps optimize the gear shifts. So when you're in power mode, it actually helps the car accelerate faster. But you do have to be careful because it does eat up a lot more fuel. This button is for the adaptive suspension. In sport mode, it's supposed to stiffen the ride, especially in circumstances like when you're braking hard. However, in my personal experience with Toyotas from this era, it really hasn't been too effective. On the driver's seat, you have power lumbar support and can also adjust the seat width manually with this knob. This roof design is pretty cool. Reminds me of Caterpillar. Jumping to the second row, this passenger seat is as far back as possible and you can see you have enough knee room. You also have loads of headroom and it's nice that you can actually recline the seat back and forward. But 
at the end of the day, the seat feels a little low, so you're in this angle and it's not that comfortable. The only realistic way of getting into the third row is by flipping the second row seat forward. And once you're back here, well, let's just say the second row is a lot more comfortable. A lot of people got this third row for that extra trunk space and also because they can actually save on taxes by registering it as a cargo van. However, if you're importing it to America, you do have to be careful because that actually increases the customs duties. All right, let's go for a drive. The first thing you notice is the seating position. It does feel a little higher than your typical SUV and it gives you a very commanding view of the road. Yeah, the turning radius is not great on this one. <laughs> Try turning again here. Yeah, it's gonna be tough to make U-turns and tight spaces and three-point turns. Now, when you're just stopped, when you have a stop sign or a stop light, you could feel that the engine is grumbling a lot. Which is surprising because it doesn't grumble this much in the high aces with the same engine. Okay, I'm flooring it now. Yeah, when you floor it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got plenty of kick. I'm up to speed already. This engine is great. In terms of the comfort, I'm on a road that has a lot of imperfections and I really don't feel any of them. And so it does live up to the name or the theme of this vehicle in comparison to the Land Cruisers, which are supposed to be less comfortable and more geared towards carrying heavier loads. This Prado looks awesome and is fitted with a fantastic engine. It does drive like a big old car, but when you consider it's one of the most capable and reliable vehicles of all time, it's easy to see why people still love it today. Thanks for watching.